Assalamu alaikum. Thank you all for coming. My name is Jihai Hakim, member of the UMC, Unified Muslim Community. And um, I'd like to present the first speaker of the day. Uh, his name is Mark Gonzalez, a social entrepreneur and a radical poet, best known for his appearances on HBO's Death Poetry Jam. Um, and also, he appeared on first, uh, the first um, on TED. Um, he was the first one to be aired in Palestine. He is appreciated for his creative work towards suicide prevention, human rights, and human development via narrative therapy. Welcome, Mark and Alex. Assalamu alaikum. It's nice to have people who respond. For some reason, a lot of our generation and a lot of these days and times, it seems we're a little bit numb. Uh, so when you tell people, Salaam Alaikum, sometimes they're like, <laughs> and you're like, interesting times we live in. Um, I always, in spaces like this, uh, one, it's important for me before beginning anything, uh, Always give thanks, uh, always give thanks. Give thanks to the one, give thanks to the organizers who put this on, give thanks to the ancestors who brought us here, give thanks to the children who will bring it forward. Uh, but to most and first most, always give thanks. Um, when I was asked to speak today, often when people ask someone who writes and tells stories uh, to come tell a story, there's kind of this idea uh, behind what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to get up here, and you're supposed to tell a story, and you're supposed to make people laugh, or people have an emotion. And kind of this idea of entertainer, where they're kind of like, yay, tell story, brown man. Uh, and a lot of us have played these roles in different places on the planet, in different times of life, and we know that's not why stories matter to us. Uh, and so I started thinking about this story of W.D. Mohammed. Uh -huh. And I started thinking about his legacy and what a young Chicano indigenous brother who was born from Alaska, whose parents were displaced from Mexico, whose mother committed suicide, what type of story do I have that makes it so necessary for me that the story of W.D. Mohammed is not just shared within our community, but is also brought back to my community. And I thought about the chaos we're living in right now, and I thought about the chaos of governments. And I have friends, my cousin lives in Chicago, and the mass shooting that was there, and teachers I know in East Oakland, and the shootings that are going on there, and the chaos of the streets. And I started thinking about all the ads that we see every day, and the ways that they demonize our people in our prayers, and the chaos that goes on with that. And I just looked up at the clouds last night. And I don't know how many of you actually took the time to do that, but if you looked up, there was like this break. Um, it was before the, the, the rain came in today, but there was just this huge break in the middle of the sky. And it kind of looked like the, the sky was about to swallow us up. And I appreciate those days. And I appreciate that because I realized we weren't about to be swallowed up. We already are. And we're actually on the inside looking out. And we all are going to leave out someday. <laughs> when, who knows, you know, well, the one knows, but we don't know. And I thought about that leaving out. And all I could think of is that my purpose in life between that moment of leaving out and that moment called now is just to continually tell myself it's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to be Muslim. It's a good day to be alive and it's a good day to be Muslim. And I started thinking about stories and I started thinking about why the nation of Islam originally and then Malcolm and then W.D. Muhammad and then the entirety of this story of Islam resonated so much with me. And I realized because growing up as a person within this country and within this hemisphere, even though my people go back thousands of years here, that I was never told it was a good day to be alive. 
that it was never a good day to be me, much less a good day to be Muslim. And so when I first started learning and growing up and hearing a little bit about this person called, you know, Elaj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, and what he was bringing, I realized as I got older as a person who tells stories, that stories are the engine of identity, they're how we learn ourselves. And often we're not in control of our stories. And there's profound health effects of people who are not in control of their stories, because it means someone else is driving their story. Mm -hmm. And I think about that and I thought about like why Malcolm resonated so much with me. And I realized is that in everything he said was that energy of it's a good day to be alive, it's a good day to be Muslim. And I came across this quote by W.D. Muhammad who said, we should realize the first identity is not European, it is not African, it is not Saudi, it is a human being. And as long as we build upon that foundation that Allah gave us, the human foundation, we are in good shape. It's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to be Muslim. And so I started thinking about why W.D. Muhammad matters so much to not only this community, but should matter to every community, is because he reminds us that, that it's a good day to be alive. It's a good day to be Muslim. It's a good day to be me, and it's a good day to be you. And so when I think about that, I think about all the stories that we need to start telling that change the way we think about ourselves and change the way we love ourselves and change the way we constantly feel we have to defend ourselves and really just say, who are we? Um, I wanted to just share one story with you before departing. Uh, and it's a story I tell often, and I wanted to tell it to you because I think in these days and times where we're trying to remember the human foundations, as W.D. Muhammad so eloquently reminded us, um, that often we're told to only focus on our issue. And so people always ask me, what are you as a Chicano? Why are you speaking on Palestine? Why are you speaking on women's issues? Why are you speaking on the black community's issues? Why are you speaking on immigrants' issues? Why are you speaking on this issue? And I'm like, because they're all our issues. They're family issues. Because you're my family, and I care about my family. And if someone tries to harm my family, I love my family enough to protect my family. And so as I look at my family, I started thinking about this argument that had happened um, at the center of this place they called Ground Zero uh, about five, six years ago around a masjid they wanted to build there. And does anybody remember what the name of that masjid was? Because it was all over the news for like three years straight and it really annoyed me. Ground Zero what? Well, so there was a Ground Zero mosque. That was what it was named, but it really wasn't even a mosque. Like if MCA actually, you know, if we look, it's a center more than a masjid. There's specific terminologies we use. Uh, and so one, we responded to it. We said, oh, it's a mosque. You know, we should have the right. It, it wasn't even a mosque. Does anyone know what the name of it? Park 51. Park 51. Also, Cordoba Center. And the ironic thing to me of the argument of whether or not the Cordoba Center should be allowed to be built was there's all these Muslims in the area and they need a place to pray. And there was a specific type of Muslim they were referring to. It was the immigrant Muslim community. It wasn't the black Muslim community. And to me, one of the things that was really absent from this conversation is that there was something underneath that entire area where they were trying to build the Cordoba Center. Uh, and it was underneath, actually, the World Trade Center. They were found, like, uh, in, in the cleanup. Does anyone know some of the things they found after they took away, like, the steel and everything else? Um, slave, slave burial. Slave burial bones. And anyone who really, again, knows the story of indigenous and stolen people, know that we're a diverse people. And we have multiple ways of being and multiple ways of loving the one that made us. And one of the things in this story of ourselves that isn't told 
is that 30%, it's estimated, of all Africans stolen from Africa and brought to this continent were Muslim. Mm -hmm. And so if we have that, and we have them being buried on that ground, then we're not trying to build a new center. We've always been there. We're just asking for our right to pray. That's about five centuries overdue. And so with that, I imagine this story of what if we started telling our stories different? What if instead of asking, we just reminded them? And so on that, I want to offer you a letter. It's a letter to the Cordoba Center. It's on behalf of the people they formerly called, quote, slaves. One, the three century old remains of 20,000 African men, women, children, former slaves were discovered after the cleanup of the World Trade Center's collapse too. Between 20 and 30% of all stolen Africans brought to America as slaves were Muslim. Three, a letter on behalf of the Cordova Center by one such slave. Bismillah is an unspoken song on the tongues of the forgotten. Ever wonder where you will pray when your skin has abandoned you or what religion is your skeleton? A note for Manhattan City residents and Mr. President, if cemeteries have zip codes, airmail this poem to my mother, courtesy of a masjid's wings holding my father's tears in New York. Have you forgotten cities are built not by steel, but bones and breath? Is a turquoise colored accessory of a skeleton wearing mahogany skin like it was our Friday prayer vest? bed bones have a project runway dream. It's to run away from the projects. We're tired of being told our shade is out of season by men in midnight blue suits who attempt to tie a two thumb thick bow tie noose around their neck. Strange fruit is back. It is the new and the old black in time for spring seasons. Muslim against the design, breathing, chest heaving, swinging from government branch limbs. Dear America, I interrupt your tea party with reminders of ancestral legacy that picked those leaves you sip. They say 30% of all slaves stolen from Africa were Muslim, denied prayers on ship lynched and mocked, works for worshiping, shot for slot, slaves to the dollar, enslaving slaves of Allah. When you, bait the, when you built the World Trade Center over our cemeteries, did Senegalese mothers hold drum circle protests at construction companies for the steel saliva you layered on their children's coffin? New York City's living pretty luxurious brag about how little skin they own that one can see their bones through their ribcage as if Prada was fashioning a design mannequin after auction block melanin. In 2002, 20,000 African slaves were discovered underneath the catwalk modeling a state of decay in the basement of what they called the World Trade Center, slaves, models. Both believe in God. One is tolerated for invoking the name in anorexia's reverse communion like they practice Ramadan 365 days a year. A stomach lining sacrifice offering the porcelain altar in a city subsidized stall and club the other. We are children hiding with no one seeking, holding song of Quran in decomposed lungs for three centuries. The sum of Salah Hadin's sons and daughters under 103 steel exhales separated from the Ummah by a cracked twin tear only homage is a memory a street cipher testimony a windmill break dance spin cycle of seven for circles never made around the Kaaba in Mecca Cordoba thank you for daring to call a den in a den of lions illiterate to love they call our cemeteries ground zero nicknaming us in La Tierra negative below 
the absence of value. America, tell us in this space, this moment, this century, as you stand over our graves, that 20,000 spirits still do not have a right nor a place to pray. New York, you're building zones, built homes upon our bones. Must you again deny us in death our rights you denied us in life? We deserve after centuries to finally say, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Know our prayers end as they always do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all and to you. Sincerely signed X, 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 nineteen thousand nine hundred. 95 more times and may we always remember no matter the time it's a good day to be alive it's a good day to be muslim I'm very much touched by the last presenter because I'm very historical when I look at our experience as human beings. And what he said today, I don't know him, but what he's saying to you, because I am just listening to what he was saying before I go into talking about Imam Wardin Muhammad and his legacy in the Muslim experience, the African American experience. And I hope that by the time I finish with you, many of you will see yourself in what I'm saying. And for a moment, I ask your permission to really travel with me on my mental highway. And I will put you on my HOV lane so that you will all be traveling with me as we look at this whole narrative. I'm very grateful to the organizers of this meeting. What you just heard today from our colleague who told you about the Latino experience, if you are historical, you can see how his experience Go back to those people he was talking about. Because if you are a Latino, you combine Africa, the Native American, and Europe all together. Any working Latino is all three in one. And if you are an African American, whether we like it or not, we have Africa, we have <coughs> some of the African Americans certainly have Native American ancestry, and we have European ancestry. We embody those histories. We cannot deny that. That's our history. These two of Latinos. So when they talk about what happened over there at Wall Street, we know one of our African-American scholars at Howard University, who is now at University at William and Mary now in Virginia, but he was one of those guys who dug and found those African-Americans at the Wall Street. That's part of your story. One of our colleagues at Howard was the person who on, they, did, they, they were digging. They found it. And that is now history. There are books about the blacks in New York. If you look at the history, it's there. So we are educated now. We're not village people. We are educated people. What he was saying, you can go and find out for yourself. Let me just shift gear and go to why 
we are here and we are trying to remember the legacy of the late Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I have identified a number of points to raise. Who was Imam Wardin Muhammad? Number two, the Elijahian legacy, meaning his father, Elijah Muhammad, and Weberian. There was a white American who was also a Muslim here. His story is part of our story too. But we are focusing on Imam Wardin Muhammad. We took at the Imam of the late Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his impact in American society. People don't want to talk about it. I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> the, the other thing I want to talk about is Imam Wardi Muhammad and his teachings and his legacies as it affected all of us here and all the people who are part of the internet around the world who are going to hear this. We'll talk about self-definition, the Imam definition of self-definition and what that means for people who came after his father and under his leadership before he passed away. Then you have his ability to negotiate between Islam and the black identity in America. That is part of his legacy. The Imam, Imam Walid Muhammad in Africa in the imagination of Imam Walid Muhammad. There's another poll that is part of his story. We have Imam Walid Muhammad and the immigrant community in America. We have Imam Walid Muhammad and the interfaith dialogue. We have Imam Walid Muhammad and the construction of a viable community of Muslim African Americans. That's part of his legacy. Then you have to talk about how the Imam added to the book of, you see in American society, people like to have acronyms. They like to have, in the United States, many names. If you look at book of names in America, the legacy of Elijah Muhammad and Imam Wadid Muhammad and all of the Imams around the country is very evident in terms of the idea of a Bilalian, World Muslim Community of Islam that was part of the legacy. And there are a lot of things that came out of this experience, which is part of the American experience. They are all legacies of the Imam. I'm going to elaborate on this point. Then you have Imam Walidin Muhammad and the construction of an African-American Muslim community in American society. This is known in America. And if you go for Hajj, the African-American Muslim presence is there. Among all the Muslim Muslims who come from all over the world, they are there for Umrah and for Hajj. And that is part of the narrative. The last part is we will give concluding remarks about Imam Wardin Muhammad. Let me just take you back to the beginning. Who was Imam Wardin Muhammad? Imam Wardin Muhammad came out of the legacy of his father who came out of Georgia. In the 1920s, you have a large number of African Americans who are migrating from the South. Over 60% of the African Americans live in the South at that time. As America was beginning to industrialize after the Civil War, America was doing what Chinese are doing today in the world. Chinese now, they have dollar store all over the country. The American products were all over the world at that time. What the Chinese are doing now, 120 years ago, that's what America was doing among European countries. That was why, give me the real McCoy. It came from that narrative. When the American industry was beginning to affect Europeans, America was a backwater area. But by that time, after the Civil War, America was beginning to industrialize. Large number of African Americans were living in the South. The whole legacy of Elijah Muhammad revolved around the migration of large number of blacks going to New York, to Boston, Hartford, Chicago, Detroit, all the way to California here. That's part of the black migration. In fact, an African-American sister just published a book on that whole experience. You can find for yourself. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is, if you want to understand the imam, you have to understand that black migration from the south to the north. They came from Georgia, and Georgia is very interesting in African-American history. Out of Georgia, you have Martin Luther King from that part of that narrative. So if you are talking about the imam, you have to understand that black migration to the north. There were many African Americans in the north before. And that's one of the reasons why the story of the nation of Islam, as you are going to know, the members of the nation of Islam, you will hear more details from my brother, Imam 
Karim is going to tell you more because he knows the detail. I'm telling you as a scholar what we know from outside as scholars. And what I want to make very clear to do is that if you look at Imam Wadi Muhammad, you have to understand the black migration from the south, how his father came to Detroit and working in the automobile business. If you look at the history of the automobile business, you have to pay attention to Henry Ford. Henry Ford was a very strange character. Many Jews see him that he was anti-Jewish because of his statements. But he liked Arabs, particularly Yemenis. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why if you are a student of American history, you go to Detroit. For African Americans, we remember Detroit because of the musician, we talk about Motown. But if you come out of the Arab experience, you will remember that in Detroit, you have a large number of Arabs, Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, Yemenis. And when they came in, they are in Dearborn, Michigan. That's why Dearborn, Michigan is the mecca of Arabs in this country. The Elijah Muhammad, the late Honorable Elijah Muhammad, came to Detroit working in the automobile. That's where he is going to meet Farad Muhammad. And that's how the story started. Most of the scholars you are going to read, they're going to tell you that story based on what they know. They have some truth, they have some untruth. And that's part of the story. The people who came out of that movement can speak the story. That's their tell the story. That's their story. When I wrote as a scholar, I came to know a lot from the Imam himself when he was alive and from many people around him. And that's what scholars do. You try to see Eric Lincoln was the one who gave the name Black Muslim. He tell his own story at a meeting with the Imam when he was teaching over there in Emory University. That tape is available to you. And there he told how he himself, as a graduate student trying to study, just like Martin Luther King, studying out there in Boston University, he came to know Malcolm X. That's what he said. And it was he, it was through Malcolm he came to know Malcolm X. I mean, uh, no, he came to know, uh, uh, he knew uh, the boxer, Muhammad Ali, who was fighting Sonny Liston at that time. That whole story is now, now known. What I try to tell you, if you look at the, who was Imam Wadi Muhammad, you have to know the migration of the blacks from the south to the north, and how his father worked with the automobile industry out in Detroit. And then later on, he will move to Chicago. And Chicago will become the major instrument of that movement. And Chicago will play a very important role in the development of the movement. Now, the Imam <coughs> will inherit from the 1930s right up to 1975. That's a long time. That was the leadership of his father. In 19, February 1975, Imam Waridin Muhammad took over the leadership. And of course, the rest is known to many of you. Some of you are young, in your 20s or older, but from 25 to the point he passed away, just before Obama became president of the United States in 2008. So during that time, he exercised leadership of the movement. And that is one of the reasons why, if you talk about who was Imam Wadi Muhammad, you see him as an American leader who inherited the most powerful black organization at the time when he took over was the most powerful African-American organization. You have all these African-American organizations, NWCP, Urban League, and all the other, and you have many black churches. But the Nation of Islam, as it was identified at the time, was the most powerful financial organization of the African-American community. Now, if you have any doubt about that, I challenge you, if you're a scholar, if you're a journalist, or an ordinary citizen, Go and find our resources. If you have evidence, read me, send me an email, and I will tell you otherwise. Use my sources. Now, the point I'm trying to make, two points about the late Imam Wadid Muhammad, is that Imam Wadid Muhammad did not only inherit from his father an organization that organized the African Americans. The only group that paralleled his achievement is the achievement of, double <coughs> of Marcus Garvey. The Jamaican who came to America, at Gavi was in England. He met a gentleman called Duse Muhammad Ali, who was a Nubian. His story is well known. Duse Muhammad Ali had influence on the Asians and the Africans and the Latinos who were fighting against colonialism and imperialism. 
He has a journal called African Times and Orient Review. If you want to know about it, just go to Google and put that name. And there are books about him now. Now, that, do say Muhammad Ali himself, the Nubian, Egyptian, Sudanese, would come to America. There are books about him. But he was like a mentor of Gavi. Then Gavi will come to America and he'll influence many of these movements in this country. So when you talk about Imam Wadi Muhammad, you are talking about black migration, that part of the story. You have to talk about the automobile industry and black Americans working at the, in Detroit and the automobile industry and how his father came out of that from Sanderville in Georgia to Detroit and then Chicago. And then a movement came out of that. So when you talk about the Elijahian legacy, whether people like Elijah Muhammad, or, I've said this many times, I have written about this. This man was the most powerful man I know among African Americans who changed the lives of thousands of people in this country. How? Most of the people in social welfare, and so, we have a whole unit at Howard, social, they study social services. And you have the School of Social Work. They specialize in community building. Many of them will confess that what the late Elijah Muhammad was able to do in the African American community has never been duplicated by anybody because he touched the life of so many people. And those people became revolutionary transforming agents who changed the life of many people. It has to be said. And that's part of history. You cannot change history. We're talking about the past. You cannot re-edit it. It's happened already. So what I'm trying to say is you have the Elegean legacy. Now, if you're a Muslim, and you're an immigrant, if you don't know anything about this, please, please, please go to the used bookstores and read about this story about the African-American experience. No, I'm very serious with many immigrants. Some of us are tone deaf and we can be blind temporarily. <laughs> but what I'm saying categorically clear, not only for those who are here, but for those of you who may come to know what we are saying through the internet, and you may be somewhere else in the world, please, Go to your libraries and go to the internet and you know how the Elegean legacy affected American society. You cannot talk about, I have said this to some people, say, Suleiman, you should not say that. There can be no Obama today if the Elijah Muhammad was not here. I say it loud. <laughs> because he changed the society radically. Because for the African Americans, what they have to pay close attention to with the Elegean narrative is that if you go back to history, if you look at the period I'm talking about, the transition from the migration of black people, most of them were in the South to the North, you have two intellectuals who have great influence of the African American. And if you talk about these intellectuals, usually most African Americans don't want to bring these two, three people together. We talk about two black intellectuals who affected this country. We talk about Booker T. Washington. And we talk about W.E.B. Du Bois. Now, Gavi sometimes is brought in the narrative, but they don't mention Elijah Muhammad in this story. I'm going to do it now. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is this. There is a reason for it, why I'm saying this to you. When slavery ended, remember before the end of slavery, you have the Dred Scott case known to many of you, the Dred Scott case, where they were saying that the white man should not respect anything about the black man. That's part of American history. We cannot re-edit that, it's history. After the Civil War, you have the 13, 14, 15 Amendment. It changed the whole narrative. Now, at that particular time in history, when we talk about the legacy of Imam Wadid Muhammad, this way you will understand what Imam Wadid Muhammad tried to do in his lifetime. You see, he knew all these narratives when he inherited the leadership from his father with the support of all the imams and the FOI people. And it has come to the level we are now. What I'm trying to tell you, if you go back, you look at the migration of African Americans from the south to the north, and the industrial revolution of America and how it changed the life of American society and the life of African Americans. You have two black intellectuals, Booker T. Washington. He recognized that in the history of the African American people, most of the blacks who landed on 16 
you know the Jamestown narrative. Yes, right. You have 1619. Most blacks know that, 1619. They were blacks in Florida before that time with the Spanish. Right. They don't talk about that story. They only talk about you coming as slaves. <laughs> that is one of the reasons why you have the Mayflower narrative. That's why one of the African-American editor of Ebony magazine came with, they came before the Mayflower. You have three stories. Jamestown, those whites who came from England to Jamestown, that's the Jamestown story. But there were blacks who were here before this guy who came in 1620. That's why Leron Bennett, editor of Ebony, would say they came before the Mayflower. You, these are stories you have to understand. You cannot understand Elijah Muhammad. You cannot understand the Imam unless you know these stories. When these people who came, they were mainly from Angola. That's what is related by one of our scholars and uh, thinkers. You may know him, Randall Robinson, who fought very hard against apartheid in South Africa. He is from Virginia himself. He said that his ancestry could be traced back to those first wave of blacks who came to Jamestown. Now, what is very interesting for us to understand these two black intellectuals who are related to the story of Imam Wadid Muhammad is the story of Booker T. Washington, who was a Virginian. Booker T. Washington became the most powerful black American in this country. And he was sufficiently influenced by other black thinkers before. But Booker T. Washington affected all of us here today, right now. At that time, most of those people who were Africans, one out of every 16 African Americans were called free blacks. That's why the oldest churches of the African Americans were called African Methodist Episcopal Church. Richard Allen, you know that. The African Methodist Church, Zion. You see, it came from that. That was why those free blacks, if you find, you talk about all that we talk about, Twin Towers and all that, those blacks, you have many of them were so-called free blacks. They were part of that story. That's one of the reasons why if you look at this story, and I'm saying this for immigrants to know this about the African-American story. When you talk about, you find, if you look at these so-called free blacks, they have the Free Black Society of Charleston, Richmond, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Delaware, New York, all the way to Providence, Rhode Island. You can go to Google and find about this for yourself. What I'm trying to emphasize for you right now to understand Imam Wadi Muhammad's story. He knew this story, and there were many intellectuals, African Americans, who were working with him, they knew this, and many of them are educated, who are Imams, they know this story. What I'm trying to say is, Booker T. Washington, and you will understand what the Nation of Islam did in terms of self-definition of black people in this country. What happened is, Booker T. Washington, he came out of slavery, up from slavery, he has his own book, you can read. Booker T. was the one who gave us, black people here, we are called Negroes. He was the one who came with it. There were some black journalists who were telling him we should call ourselves African-American. He refused. Or Afro-American, he refused. Because he knew that the Europeans who were taking over Africa after the Civil War, they were describing Africa as primitive and backward. And many of us remember this Tarzan story. <laughs> now what is very interesting is this. What the Nation of Islam is going to do, when Booker T came with that notion, Booker T knew that if you use the word Negro, most African Americans, they don't know Spanish. Negro means black. That's what he did. It would be very ironic today in America that we have many Latino brothers if all African Americans were called Negroes. And by the way, they were, there was some zoological twist to it. This was before feminism, by the way. How do they call the black woman? Negress, like tiger tigress. <laughs> That's the way it was. The contribution of the nation of Islam was they eliminated that word, the so-called Negroes. And that gradually, that term disappeared. That's part of history. You see, Booker T's contribution, what he did when Jesse Jackson, interestingly enough, Martin Luther King came from Georgia just like Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he influenced King and many others with the SCLC, Jesse Jackson from North Carolina will come 
to Chicago and he will run for the presidency twice without success. Lo and behold, at the time of his glory, Jesse Jackson went back to the suggestion of those scholars who told Booker to, we should call ourselves Afro-American or African-American. Today we all call ourselves African-American because of Jesse Jackson. That's history today. So if you want to understand Imam Warid and Muhammad, you have to go back to that story. The Imam was very much aware of that. Jesse Jackson was in Chicago with him. So when the Imam came, he wanted to redefine the identity of the African Americans. He knew the story of Bilal from Ethiopia. Because the Prophet Muhammad himself, when these followers were being persecuted, did he send them to Syria? No way. Did he send them to other places? No. He asked them to go where? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. And in Mecca, there was a guy called Bilal. That was when the Imam came, he wanted to redefine himself. You know, he's African American. This was before Jesse Jackson came to that term. <laughs> so he said, we are Bilalian. You see, what he was doing, he was trying to tell the African American Muslims that you do have a history that goes way before you came to America. That you do have a black identity, not black being, no, Bilal was elevated when Islam came. So we are going to elevate ourselves. That's what the Imam was doing. Now, of course, I remember this myself. As a young scholar, I remember some of the Muslims saying, why he call himself Bilalian? You see, I said, the man knows history. That's what he's doing. But some of them were, that was why the Imam, after he knew that the message was gone, already with his followers, then they came with the idea, the whole community of Islam in the West. And if you want to find this, if you are young and you are too young to understand, just go and look at the history of the paper from Muhammad Speaks and all the transformation to where it is. The second person I want to bring in the discussion for you to understand Imam Warid and Muhammad. We talk about Booker T and how the so-called Negro was destroyed by the nation of Islam. Then you come back now and took at W.E.B. Du Bois. W.E.B. Du Bois was a very powerful intellectual among the African Americans. W.E.B. Du Bois didn't like Marcus Garvey for a variety of reasons. Some of you may know this already. But what I'm trying to you now to understand Imam Wadid Muhammad and this narrative about American history is that when you look at Imam Wadid Muhammad and the legacies of W.E.B. Du Bois, two points are very important. The Imam Wadid Muhammad was aware of the tension between Gavi and Du Bois, he knew that. There was a question of color and all the other things involved in that narrative. The fact that you are from the Caribbean and we are from America. These are all part of that narrative. When Gavi came from England and became powerful, he was able to organize the most successful organization of African Americans. Over two million African Americans were mobilized. He wanted to take them back to Africa. Unfortunately for him, he established the Black Star Line which was supposed to move all the black people. He, that's why they, there are books called him Black Moses. That's why they call him. Because he wanted to do for, most, for the blacks what Moses did for the Jews out of Egypt. And he has the Black Star Line. Unfortunately, they put him in jail in 1924, later release. And then he went back to England. And of course, now in Jamaica, he's immortalized now in Jamaican society. But if you look at Imam Wadid Muhammad and his legacy, you can see how the Imam redefine the identity of the African-American Muslim so that you have a Bilalian narrative that takes you way before the immigrants came here in terms of being a Muslim. He took you back there. And then when he goes, that was with Booker T, he knows that we are not so-called Negroes. We are something else. <laughs> you see, so when the Imam look at the legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois, one thing that Du Bois did when he was fighting with Booker T, he was highly educated. He didn't want the word Negro. He know Negro means black. But if you look at the African-American community, we have different colors. We have different colors among African-Americans. You see, so we see, that is why when Du Bois came around, he used the word colored, because the word colored will embrace everybody. And Obama has benefited from this. Because whether you are from Hawaii, whether you are Chicano, whether you are African-American, you are all colored. If you come from South Asia, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if you go to England, that's how they see you. 
You are colored. They call it the color bar. <coughs> Mahatma Gandhi learned the hard way when he went to South Africa. He, thank you very much. You see, so that becomes very important narrative. You see, so when you look at the Imam Wadin Muhammad's story and his legacy, you have to see how he was negotiating the identity of the African American. That's why Thomas self definition, the negotiation between black identity and Islam. Imam and the immigration issue become very clear in my narrative right now. Then you have Imam Wadin Muhammad and the interfaith dialogue. When he looks at the African American community, he knows that some of the African Americans were, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he recognized that the Imam was very much aware of the fact that if you look at the African American population before his father had his organization out of Chicago, 90, thank you very much, 90% of the African Americans were Protestants, 10% are Catholics. And the statistics has changed. Likely because when his father's organization developed in the African American community, you see gradually a growing number of Catholics and Protestants who were in the black community becoming followers of his father and himself. And today you have millions of African Americans who are Muslims and they can negotiate with the old identity of being a Negro or colored. You don't deal with that, you are just African American, period. <laughs> So you deal with your identity that respect. So when it came to interfaith dialogue, the Imam came to realize very well that we have Catholics, we have Protestants in the group. Some of them are Jehovah Witnesses. One of the American president was Jehovah Witness. He changed his position before he became president. Eisenhower, he was Jehovah Witness, but he changed from being Jehovah Witness. But there are many people who are Jehovah Witnesses who joined the nation and they became Muslim. Some of them were Catholics. I know many of them personally. So what I'm trying to tell you now is that if you look at Imam Wadid Muhammad, he accomplished five things in the field of interfaith dialogue. Number one, he was able to establish meaningful relationship with many of the African American Christians who were dealing with it. Evidence of that is people like Martin Luther King and Jesse Jackson. Before King passed away, you have a famous picture of him and Elijah Muhammad. Not widely talk about, but it's part of the story. You see, the big problem is people like Jesse Jackson, they know the Imam very well. You see, and many of the Imams can testify what I'm saying to you now. The, what I'm saying to tell you, if you look at the interfaith dialogue of the Imam, one of the major successes of the Imam was he met the Pope himself. And that was a major achievement of the Imam before he passed away. Here is an African American who is a leader of a religious group going to the Vatican and speaking and the post was listening to him. That's history now. It was not invented by Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> so what is very... And there are imams here who can say that Nyang is not alive. There are imams who can speak to that. They were there. You see, so what I'm trying to tell you here is if you look at Imam Wardin Muhammad and his legacy, in the field of self-definition, you already heard what I said. In his field of interfaith dialogue, you can see how he negotiated with the Catholics. I was present myself. I was not in Rome, but I was present. Myself, John Esposito, and a number of scholars, we were in Baltimore. You see, when a Nigerian cardinal was sent by the Pope to see the cardinal he, over there, I was there at that meeting. That was a testimony to the achievement of Imam Wadi Muhammad, that he was respected by the Catholic leadership, that when they are sending any of their emissaries who is going to deal with interfaith dialogue with some of their cardinals. We were in Baltimore, I remember, I was there at that meeting. So that was an old evidence that he was involved in building. Now, the Imam was also very much involved in negotiating with other leaders, Christian and Jewish leaders, because I remember in Chicago, there was a major dialogue between the Muslim community and the religious groups in Chicago, in the Seoul area there. And the Imam was very much present at that event. And that testified to his role. If you want to see evidence of that, if you are a young scholar and you want to verify this, please just go and look at the back issues of the Muslim journal and you see evidence
of how the various imams in their various localities were involved in interfaith dialogue. Time is running against me. I have about two, three minutes. But what I'm going to say to you now is that if you look at Imam Waridin Muhammad and the interfaith movement, and I have spoken about this in other places. You can look that in the alternate somewhere. The, the thing is, Imam Waridin Muhammad was able to engage the members of the religious community nationally and internationally. And he was one of the leaders of the World Federation of Religion and Peace. And he was very much part of that story. So the Focolore group, some of you are familiar with Focolore group. And the Focolore group were very much involved to the point that many imams and leaders of the Imam Wadi Muhammad group used to travel with the Focolore. That's part of history now. The last point I will say about interfaith dialogue, and I can say many, many more things on this issue, is to say when you look at Imam Wadi Muhammad in the interfaith group, you have to recognize the fact that the Imam had many Imams working for him in various jurisdictions around the country who were pushing this in their own way. And all of them in their own capacities did very well for the community in their own localities around the country. And that's history now. And it's all legacy. The Imam is just one man. You are one man. But if you have many people who are traveling with you, I just ask you to be on my mental highway. The Imam was trying to do that. He get many people to be with him on their mental highway and they will see many milestones on the journey. And he did. And many people can testify to that. So the last point I want to leave you with is that if you look at Imam Maridin Muhammad and his community, you will see that the Imam was engaged in institution building. He decentralized his father's legacy and allowed each Imam to exercise jurisdiction over his area. Some of them did very well. And some of you are part of that narrative. You can testify to the achievement of the Imam and those who came after. That's what you can do. Muhammad, the Prophet, when he died, there was Omar ibn Hattab, you have Ali, you have Usman, and then Abu Bakr, who was the first one to come. And they carry his legacy. Today, one of the major achievements of the Prophet Muhammad was that every Muslim today, when you pray as a Muslim, you say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad, come on salli ala Sayyidina Ibrahim. This way, your story is linked to Abraham. So if you live in America today, you are linked with the Christian and the Jews, whether they like it or not. And if you are following Elijah Muhammad and his son, you know Elijah Muhammad is alive because his son tried to do what his father did. And there are many people who were affected by that legacy and in their own way they're doing what they do. So please, 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 each one of you carry the message forward. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank <laughs> you.